today from this subject, fighting against the suppression of God's truth. Fighting against the suppression of God's truth. Father, may we preach today as never before, anoint us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Save the soul that's near as hell. Open the eyes of the blind. Quicken the ears of the hearers. Bless our perception in the name of Jesus. Bless me with precision and specificity. Give me the ability to say what you would have me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Fighting against the suppression of God's truth. Amen? I want to begin today, and I really want you to, to hear me. I, if you can, if you can, please keep the walking at a minimum. And uh, check your phones, make sure they're off. Uh, and, and hear this, because God is speaking to us. And some things you can't afford to half hear. There is a well-organized, well-funded, powerful, global, larger than national, global, secular, as well as a religious effort to put down, subdue, to crush, and to keep back God's truth. It's well funded. And it's ancient. The Apostle Paul recognized that it was at work during his lifetime. In fact, it was in operation before Paul started his ministry. The Apostle addressed it this way. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 7 Chapter 2, excuse me, in verse 7, he said, The mystery of iniquity doth, D-O-T-H, doth already work. That is, the work of the Antichrist, the work of the enemies of the gospel, is alive and well, even in Paul's lifetime, highly organized belief systems were already in place to interfere with, to pull down, to stop, to hinder the hearing of God's truth. It is prophesied that in the last days that the gospel would be something that would be good gospel preaching would be hard to find. Yes, sir. And that people would have to run to and fro trying to find a word from the Lord. The Bible is right. Yes, and we got to make sure that we value the word of God. The Bible says in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, the Bible says, <clears throat> Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread. It's going to be plenty of that. Not a thirst for water, plenty of beverage but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, plenty of food, plenty to eat, plenty to drink, 
But a good preacher who will preach the Bible is hard to find. So they will be rare. Look at this. And look at the response. It says, and they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro. People will travel. They will go here and there to seek the word of the Lord. And here's what's said, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sins of Samaria, that is, those who put their faith in false religions, false doctrines, and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth and the manna of Bathsheba liveth, and that is again, serving false gods, even they shall fall and never rise up again. If you are aware, you can hear the word of the Lord. The Bible preached with power and authority. You better tell God thank you. Because those places are becoming fewer and fewer and farther and farther between. As believers, we are called to recognize these efforts when we see them and we're called to fight against them. To speak up for the God of the Bible. It's our calling. And to declare God's truth. Dr. Henry Morris, in his book, The Long War Against God, spoke to one of the leading underlying, underlining ideologies behind this effort to suppress God's truth. And this is what he said, I quote, an unprecedented confusion is now permeating the modern world. Everything has seemingly been turned upside down. And the old standard of right and wrong have been almost completely interchanged. He went on to write, ideas and theories usually have visible consequences. Effects have causes. I purpose to show in this book that there is an underlining idea behind these consequences. And that this idea, though it goes by many names, naturalism, and I'll talk to you about what that is in just a moment, materialism, we'll share the meaning of that, It is basically nothing else more than the almost sacrosanct doctrine of evolution. I want you to let that sink in. Evolution. Furthermore, this situation is nothing new, but indeed has been the underlining cause of most of the major problems of the world throughout human history. Morris goes on to say, I'm not speaking here only of Darwinism. And he's certainly dealing with Darwinism. Nor even of biological evolution in general but evolution as a total philosophy that purports to explain the origin 
and the development of all things by natural proprieties and processes in a closed universe. One with no involvement, hear me, by any external supernatural creator. And an, ide an ideology that does not include God. God is the external supernatural creator. But evolution, Darwinism, evolution as a philosophy says there is no God. In this sense, evolutionism is essentially synonymous with naturalism. And naturalism is the doctrine that religion does not depend on a supernatural experience. That all religion all religious truths may be derived from the natural world. That you can have a religion, but no experience with God. That you can derive all of your truths, all of your beliefs from the natural um, world around you. Naturalism and uh, materialism, of course, those who are materialists, you hear them, they say, I only believe in what I can see. Touch, taste, or feel. Materialism is the belief that the only thing that really matters in the world is that which can be explained by matter, by natural causes. Materialism also is the doctrine that comfort Pleasure and wealth are the highest goals and values. So this evolution that I'm talking about is synonymous with naturalism or materialism with the space, time, matter, cosmos regarded as the ultimate reality out of which everything from the elementary particles to the complex human beings has evolved. They believe that with the space, time, matter, cosmos, the cosmos, the eon, that all that is created, that it is the universe itself is regarded as ultimate reality. From the simplest particles to the most complex human beings, that it has evolved all, hear me, on its own. The leading atheist philosopher and patriarch of the modern drug culture, Aldous Huxley, his brother Sir Julian Huxley said this about evolution. He said the concept of evolution was so extended, the concept of evolution was soon, excuse me, extended into other than biological fields, inorganic, Subjects such as the, the life history of stars and the formation of the chemical elements. On the one hand, and on the other hand, subjects like linguistics, social anthropology, the social study of man, and the comparative law and religion began to be studied from an evolutionary angle. Until today, we are enabled to see evolution as a universal 
an all-prevailing process. His argument is that everything is changing, that nothing is fixed, that everything is evolving, even the world of religion. Praise the Lord. And it's evolving through a process that does not include God. Ernest Mayer, in an article called Evolution, Scientific American said this in 78, man's worldview today is dominated by the knowledge that the universe, the stars, the earth, and all living things have evolved through a long history that was not foreordained or programmed. That's a fancy way of saying God had nothing to do with it. Because we read all throughout the Bible that things were foreordained. For whom the Lord did ordain those he, for whom the Lord did predestine those he foreknew. The Bible speaks of God ordaining and knowing and setting things in motion. And yet, Mayor says there was no foreordaining or no programming. Evolution eliminates God. Why deal with this today, preacher? Let me tell you why this is so important, why I want to talk to you about evolution and park right here for a few minutes. If Genesis one and one is not true. Then Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 through Revelations chapter 22 verse 21 is not true also. That's the whole Bible. If we can't trust Genesis 1 and 1. If you can't trust that, don't show me anything Matthew said. I don't want to hear from Mark. I'm done with Luke. And uh, you just take Revelation and just throw it, throw it in the trash can. If Genesis 1 and 1 is not correct. Uh, I don't have to, Karis, convince you that your dad's words are not wholesome. All I got to do is convince you that that man who you have been told is your daddy all your life is not your daddy. If at your age you find out that your mama lied, your daddy lied, and everybody else around you lied about the identity of your daddy, and you come to the conclusion that he's actually not your father. I don't have to convince you to doubt everything else that he's told you. Because if he didn't get that part right, everything else is dead. The world wants us to disbelieve, to distrust, to question the opening statement of the Bible. If that statement is questioned, if that statement is not true, then that cancels everything else. Oh my, our nation began to die when we took Doran's theory and began to teach it. A theory that at best, is junk science. At best. For, for a thing to qualify as being real science, it has to be observable. Amen. There isn't any observable evidence 
uh, that evolution is true. There's no observed process where you saw humans evolve from apes. It's, it's junk science. It's postulating. It is believing a thing. It's, it's taking a thing at face value without having to prove anything to you. In today's world, the majority of scientists, biologists, philosophers, psychologists, and the like adhere to the evolutionist worldview. Your professors, school teachers, entertainers, they adhere to that worldview. And the point is, if you can't trust God, then there's no place for God's truth. And uh, it gets worse. There is, and these are the wolves in sheep's clothing, those who claim to be theistic revolutionists. The theistic revolutionists try to mix creationism with evolution. Yeah, you're quiet now. The Roman Catholic priest and theistic evolutionist who also was a paleontologist said this. He said evolution is a general postulate. It is a general uh, belief assumed to be true without proof. It's taken as evidence. It is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must henceforward bow and which they must satisfy in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts, a trajectory which all lines of thought must follow. Father Perry Cardin. Did you hear what he said? He said that all hypotheses, all theories, all systems must bow to the teachings, to evolution. And he called evolution a light. I read what Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I read in the Bible where the Bible teaches that Jesus is the light that lighteth every man that come into the world. Now both can't be the light because they are diametrically opposed. God bless my mother. So good to see your mom this morning. Amen. Stanley Beck of the University of Wisconsin had something to say about this, and he's another theistic evolutionist. I call them the worst. 20th century biology rests on a foundation of evolutionary concepts. The evolutionary basis uh, is also apparent in peripheral independent fields. This evolution, e evolutionary bias uh, is apparent in the peripheral independent fields such as chemistry, geology, physics, and astronomy. No central scientific concept, he said, is more firmly established in our thinking, our methods, and our interpretations than that of evolution. And that is the danger. One ideology competes with the other. The Bible says... Today, no man can serve two masters. 
Praise the Lord. You either hate one and love the other, cleave to one, or disregard the other. You cannot love God and mammon. The theistic revolutionist is very dangerous because he tries to mix a false doctrine with the truth. Either God created the heavens and the earth or he didn't. Either God made man from his own image like the Bible says or he didn't. The Bible doesn't hint that God made the chimp or the chimpanzee or the monkey or any of those things in his own image and man all over time went through the various stages and he finally began to walk upright. The first man I read about in the Bible was very intelligent. The first man that I read about named all of the animals. The first man that I read about worked. The first man that I read about had the command of language. He was brilliant in his thinking and had a relationship with God. Hallelujah. The first man, the first man, highly intelligent man, praise the Lord. And, and then God made a creature of equal intelligence. And it wasn't no uh, female monkey either. It made a beautiful woman and brought the woman to the man. Yes, he did. And then they got married and had children. Now, either you believe this or somehow in your mind there's room for, well, you know, they could have evolved. And maybe the if Adam was uh, an amoeba and he crawled out the ocean. Maybe that's what it was, but that ain't, that's not what the, the Hebrew word uh, for Adam is. It was a human, a man, a human being. Praise the Lord. What do you believe? And then, and then one of the problems with the evolutionary theory uh, is that the evolution never ends. You keep evolving. You keep evolving. You evolve right on past the cross. You evolve past a church looking like a church to nightclub church. You develop beyond a man marrying a woman. Evolution. To a man marrying a man. Now you're devolving. From a woman marrying a man to a woman marrying a woman. And you begin to embrace certain things. Why? Oh, it's easy to get you to embrace it. All I got to do is just get you to question just a little bit. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Either God did or God didn't. Either God said, let there be light or gases from I don't know where exploded and created all of this. If that were true, then that would mean that the universe is eternal. And if you college students, you're thinkers, you're trained to think, if the universe is eternal, then that means we can never run short of natural resources. 
Because anything that is eternal, by definition, you can't run out of it. So then you don't have to conserve. You don't have to save. You don't have to be frugal. You don't have to be responsible. You don't have to be uh, an environmentally safe and sound because the universe is eternal. It'll take care of itself. The truth is the universe is winding down. And if it is winding down, that means that it somehow, at some point, had to have first been wound up. And the, part, the power, the force that wound up the universe in the first place is God. The God of the Bible. MacArthur, I like something that he said in his book, The Truth War. Are you praying for me? He said apostasy poses real and present dangers today as always. Actually, he went on to say, the threat may be more imminent and more dangerous than ever. Why? Because most Christians nowadays simply do not care about the prevalence of false doctrine. Nor do they take seriously their duty to fight against apostasy. Instead, they want a friendly atmosphere. They want open acceptance for everyone, tolerance of all opposing ideas, and charitable dialogue with the apostates, end of quote. He is so right. Most people today, when they attend a church service and the preacher's subject is of, uh, like this, you're waiting for the preacher to get to the good part about God doing something about your haters. We're waiting for the word to get to the preach and get to that place about God making me a millionaire. Or the Lord, praise the Lord, solving all my problems. And while we're concentrating on things that have no eternal merit, no eternal moment. We're being surrounded by false teachers. We're being inundated by false doctrines. Our minds are being reshaped to believe that right is wrong and wrong is right. And what's sad is we don't even recognize that that is what's going on. The media has done such a great job getting people angry with one, uh, with the president, that you got people who are now willing to follow a man who is married to a man. You, you can't be thinking. If, if, if some kind of way you can look past that and, 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 and see some value, that, that means a long time ago you, 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 you stopped believing Genesis 1 and 1. So I, ain't, I don't have to get to 19. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm inching my way back to, to Romans. I'm almost done. But uh, when, you can, when you can be convinced of these things, when you can be convinced of these things and uh, believe these things, uh, you, you've stopped believing. Yesterday, uh, what was that? 20, how many people at the clinic? About 25 patients at the clinic. At least 20 of them look like us. That's typical. That's typical. That's typical. 
25 people there to have an abortion. 20 from the African-American community doing Black History Month. Go on there to make sure all the black folk in their wounds make no history and have no future. You got to ask yourself, what happened? The, I, I preach about it all the time. The ovulating population of black women in our country is 3%. Black women make up 8% of the population. The black race makes up 11 to 13%. So 8% of our population of women and of that of those women, you know, not all of them are in the childbearing years. Some are past their prime, and some haven't gotten there yet. So about 3% can have the babies. What happened to our thinking that would cause 3% of the nation's population to account for almost 40% of the nation's abortions. Something had to happen. Because you, you can't believe, as, as a people now, we can't believe Genesis 1 and 1. Let me say this, Tanya, anymore. We, we, we can't believe that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul and still insist upon these practices. I'm preaching. I'm preaching. Something... Some, somehow or another, somehow, some fundamentally wrong things got sold into our thinking. It's sort of along the lines of things that you hear us say when we get upset. We may say, don't make me act my color. It's that self-hatred. A sister said that to me one day. Oh, don't make me act my color. I said, I thought you were acting your color when you were being polite. Nobody, I didn't get the memo that acting the fool is synonymous with acting black. That's not the way I view myself. That's not the way I view my mother. It's not the way I view my wife, my daughter, my family. It's not the way I view you. I don't think, I think you're behaving yourself quite uh, admirably right now. But I don't think you're acting white. And when I see white folk acting up, I don't think they're acting black. You got to hate yourself. Somehow, something got in. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. To make you make such a statement. Before President Barack Obama was elected to the presidency, I'm glad I never said it, blacks would often say, we've already had a black president. People say, who? Bill Clinton. And we begin to say that after him and Monica. That's what we call. It's not what white people say. That's what we call. Is this black history? It's what we call acting black. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Somehow, false doctrine got weeded in. 
We stop believing that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Like the Bible says. But, you know, that's way down in Psalms 139. See, so, but if, you, but if, but, but if your head is messed up with Genesis 1 and 1, you're messed up with the Psalms. People who have convinced us of these things are people who have evil intentions. They have evil intentions. They have an evil uh, thought in mind. Thoughts in mind for you and for me. They build huge prisons. You tall, good-looking brothers in here. There is already a cell in the American uh, judicial system, in the prisons, penal system, with your name on it. You know what you ought to do? You ought to, you ought to act like you didn't get the memo. What? What? I was supposed to go to jail. What? I was supposed to rob and steal. What? I was supposed to break in and kill. Nobody told me. Wouldn't it be something if we just decided that we're not going to participate? It's not just a black and white thing for all people. But I'm, I'm talking to you because, uh, as I said in my opening, ideas have consequences. Effects have causes. You have to ask yourself at a certain point, why this? What is this that I see? Why? 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 Do we uh, have to be told to pull our pants up? Why? What? What effect? What? What happened? What happened? What happened to make us, uh, our men and women, fall for the things that we're falling for? I believe that one of the answers is that we're in churches that no longer preach the doctrine. And uh, they, they don't fight, they don't fight, they don't fight against the false teacher. They have no problem, they have no quarrel with the apostates. But the Bible teaches that we do have a quarrel with the apostates. The Bible teaches that we are to put up our dukes and fight. Someone said... To me, you don't have to contend. You have to fight for God's truth. You have to contend for it. Well, they didn't tell Jude. Jude said in Jude, uh, verse 1, Jude said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you concerning the common salvation, he said, I wanted to write a nice little letter to you. He said it was more needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, not just contend, but earnestly contend. Preach wouldn't contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. To contend literally means to fight. Earnestly contend means to fight with everything you got. Means to cry loud and spat down. Means to speak of it, speak up, speak loud, and speak often. To contend is to point out the differences between us and them. Praise the Lord, Jasmine, the gospel is right. And this other stuff is wrong. And, and we're not going to just stand off. Praise God. I feel my help. And uh, 
get over to the side and have a sweet little goody two-shoe service where we sing and dance and feel the inner uh, Facebook with praise breaks. And so everybody can learn how to shout, no, 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 no. Our brand is content. Our strength is not simply how we say it, but it's what we say. The truth is, the Bible is right. And I'm here to say today that I believe God. I believe that in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, something happened and the earth became dark and void. Praise the Lord and darkness covered the, the face of the earth. But I'm glad that, 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 that the earth was not forsaken by God. But the Bible tells me that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. And I don't know how long the earth was in that dark, cold place. Everything frozen. Everything destroyed. Genesis 1 and 1 describes a perfect universe. Perfect planet. Everything perfect. I don't know how long it was messed up. But I heard God say one day, let there be light. And if you notice, uh, he hadn't made the sun. And when God said, let there be light, everything lit up. What a mighty God we serve. I'm of the idea that this is worth fighting for. What about you today? Let me close here. I'm not at my best, but Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 13, he said, I, I, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I oftentimes I wanted to come and see you. Human frailties must be recognized when dealing with any human endeavor. All of us get tired. All people get discouraged. We get bored and disillusioned. Good God Almighty, as a result, oftentimes the work suffers. Paul said, I, I wanted to come and see you before now, but I got hindered. I'm, I'm limited and I, I'll get there when I can. I want to come and get some fruit among you like I have in other places. Thank you, Jesus. By the time Paul wrote this letter, he was now almost 60 years old, around about my age. Oh, Lord. And uh, the ministry, he'd been in ministry for almost 30 hectic energy sapping years nevertheless his enthusiasm had in no way abated I wonder do I have anybody here who can say I've been running for Jesus a long time but I'm not tired yet oh Lord I've been in this way over 40 years but I'm not tired yet. I want to get an amen from some of these veterans in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. If you've been out here for over 25 years, let me hear you say amen. If you've been serving God for over 30 years, let me hear you say amen. Woo, Lord. If you've been serving God for over 40 years, let me hear you say amen. Thank you. And if you've been out here for 40 and 50 years and beyond, you ought to 
to jump up and shout amen and wave all both of your hands. And if you've been running for Jesus and you're not tired yet, let me hear you say amen. Somebody praise God in this place. <laughs> Woo! Paul said, I am. So I want to go, I want to get to, I want to see you. I want to win some fruit among the Gentiles. He says, For I am dead. I'm dead. And that's what's missing today. In modern Christianity, most believers do not feel obligated to share their faith. Have you witnessed anybody to this week? Have you told anybody about Jesus? Have you even thought about telling anybody? Paul said, I've been out here, I'm over 60, I'm almost 60, I've been doing it for over 30 years, but I still feel a compulsion. I am dead. I owe, I owe to tell this story because somebody told me the story. My mama told me about it. Elder Turner preached about it. The saints of old talked about it. And the world still needs to hear it. We've heard the story of the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball. Tonight, those kooks in Hollywood, they're going to put on a show and tell each other how wonderful they are. They're the most immoral people in the world. They need to be saved. But people like that, they want us to hear their story, but they don't want to hear our story. But I've got a story that I want to tell. I heard, I heard the songwriter say, somebody told me of the joy they have. And somebody told me that in sorrow they could be glad. They told me that they were blind, but now they see. But I didn't think it could be until it happened to me. Now I can tell you of the joy I have. I can tell you that in sorrow I can be glad. Oh, I can tell you that I was blind, but now I see. But you won't believe that it's true until it happens to you. Everybody who's had it to happen to them, you ought to praise God right now. Saved and glad about it. Saved and glad about it. Paul said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to, uh, praise the Lord, the barbarians. I'm a debtor to the Greeks, simply put, and to the non-speaking Greeks. I'm a debtor to the wise, uh, to the unwise, to the intelligentsia, and to the most simple, all of them in Rome need to know that Jesus is the Savior. He said, so as much as in me is, I'm eager, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Good God Almighty, I love preaching the gospel. I really love it. Preaching it at the clinic down there in the open air. The devil all around, standing on the ground. Rocks on the, rocks everywhere. Cars going up and down the street. People screaming against us. And there we stand. The happy 
be warriors. Love life. White folk, black folk, crying out in the name of Jesus. I wonder today, do I have anybody here who is still eager to preach the gospel to Rome? Paul said, everybody ought to say amen for this. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many can say, I am, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why am I not ashamed? Number one, I'm not ashamed because of its origin. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, I'm not ashamed because of its operation. It is the power of God. Number three, I'm not ashamed because of its outcome. It's the power of God under salvation. It's the power that'll stop a liar from lying. It's the power that'll make the prostitute go home. It's the power that'll straighten up the hips of the homosexual. It's the power that'll cause a lady to keep her baby. It's the power you talk right. Power that'll make you stop hoeing. Power that'll make you stop running the streets. Power. 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 If you've experienced this power, let me see you. Just praise God for it. You know, I don't bother you much about your neighbor, but I think right here it's a good place to shake somebody's hand and tell them what the power has done in your life. I was lost, but he found me. I was blind, he opened my eyes. I was sinful, but he cleaned me up. I was foul mouth, and he gave me a clean mouth. I was depressed, and he gave me joy. Oh, I was going down for the third town, but it was love that lifted me. Oh, the power, oh, the glory, oh, the power of the Lord. There is nothing like the power of the gospel. Demons tremble. Demons got to run because the power is in this place. God is here. Right now, he's delivering. Right now, reach up and get your healing. Reach up and get your deliverance for the power.
Lift him up. Lift him up.
somebody tell him hallelujah. Hallelujah. The reason I'm shouting, the reason I'm giving God, giving God praise, because at this junction in the sermon, I got reminded of something. You ought to grab somebody by the hand and tell them, neighbor, I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. I the power of God to salvation. We're wrapping this up. To every man. Good God Almighty. Listen to this now. That believe. Listen to this. From faith to faith. That is from saving faith. From saving faith. From faith to the start. To faith to the finish. From faith to the time I got saved. To faith when you roll me across here. And my body is lying across here. These all died in the faith. See, when the Lord saves you, it's from faith to faith. All of this is revealed in the gospel. This is why then he reaches out and grabs Habakkuk and says, For it is written that the just shall live from the time that they're saved to the time that they die. With everything that happens in between, the just shall live Get over hills, mountains, problems, ups, downs, good times, bad times, feeling good, feeling bad, you name it. All of this, we conquer it by faith in Jesus Christ. He'll be there. He'll be there. He'll never leave you. He'll, now you the girl, are you the young lady that I talked to yesterday? I'm so glad. I saw her yesterday, and I thought she was a LeGrand. Then I found out she was a kin to some other folk I knew. I'm so glad to see you. Woo, God is so good. She was at the clinic, too, a warrior. Give her a hand. From faith to faith. Whatever you're going through, put faith on it. Put faith on it. Put faith in Jesus Christ on it. Tell the Lord, Lord, you knew when you saved me, I would run up against this. So I'm just going to trust you through it. From faith to faith. See, the righteousness of God is revealed. But now check this out. Back to the evolutionist. But also the wrath of God is revealed in the gospel from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who through their wicked
wicked ideologies, their wicked lifestyles, to the things that they want to do, they try to suppress the gospel. They try to keep you from hearing it. They try to taint it. Don't go to that church. Because if you go to that church, X, Y, Z will happen. That's to keep you from hearing the gospel. Don't read your Bible because that's an outdated book. That's to keep you from hearing the gospel. Don't listen to the preacher. Get on your cell phone. Talk. Do other things while the word is going forth. Matter of fact, talk to each other. Chit chat. Catch up. That's to keep you from hearing the gospel. There is an organized effort. There is legislation. What is it? Equality? There's a legislation right now. Listen to this. Working its way through Congress called the Equality Act. If passed into law, it would outlaw Christianity. It would out how? It would deem certain portions of the Bible in, in essence as hate speech. Every, every, you need to know. She goes, some of you, you're so busy earning a living, raising a family, living your life, in school, whatnot. You, you, you're too busy to keep up with all this. That's why the Bible said the lips of the priests should speak wisdom. Should know what's going on. Every, every leading Democrat running is for this act. Ask them. So you shouldn't have said that. I'll say it again. Ask them. Because they say it. They say it. There is, there is a well-funded, a George Soros-funded man worth 90 billion. Got all the money. All these people trying to keep past legislation to keep the gospel within the four walls of the church. And then once we get in the four walls, it's like Canada and Great Britain, then they send government officials into the church, pretending to be members of the church, hoping that they can catch the preacher saying something that they've outlawed so they can put him in jail. So now you all begin to understand why I favor one candidate over the other. I favor the one who's preventing this. You should. All that, sh all that shouting you just did, you better. If you want to keep it up. If you want to keep it up. If you still want to be able to get your breakthrough. There's a lot at stake. But most people don't know. And that's the, that is, that's the suppression. Remember, to squelch. Suppression is not to make untrue. It can be true as all get out. It's just to make sure you don't know. Oh, it's true. It's true. It's true. We just don't want you to know. It's true that when they say to you, I'm for women's rights and women's health care, they don't want you to know that ain't nobody against women getting health care. I ain't, I ain't never met anybody who's against a woman who is sick getting health care. Have you? Raise your hand if you have. But abortion is not health care. That's, that's death care. Suppress it. Suppress it. The Christian, I mean, I'm getting ready to pray. I've been up long enough. I got, you got to come back tonight. You got to hear what I got to say. Now, some of you, all of you don't work on Sunday night, but some of you got into a funk and the devil uh, got you vexed where you ain't released, you can't find your way to church, but on Sunday and all that. We're going to, we got to break that. You can, that. That's not a good practice. And it ain't, listen, it ain't going to kill your children. Where well, they got to get plenty of, God's going to bless the children. Children have been going to church 
uh, and on Sunday night, ever since they made a night, a Sunday, and children. And children get grown, and children graduate. Children do well. Praise the Lord. And what you ought to be keeping your children from is the AAU on Sundays. That's what you ought to be keeping them from. Our service didn't last too long. I thought to myself when that tragedy happened the other day, it just broke my heart because I was a fan of the young man and oh, that, 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 that loss of life. I thought to myself, man, they've been at Church of God in Christ Church service. They would have missed the flight because they'd been late because we, we wouldn't have been dismissed that fast. We ain't going to have no hour service on the Lord's Day. So you can hurry up and get to other things. I'm listening to these preachers. People got other things to do. They can't have church all day. Well, we've never had church all day anyway. But, but when, do, when does God get time? When do God get, get time? Campus gets time. The club gets time. I'm, I'm be honest with you. I used to hate. I used, I used to hate, hate to see the club in. Time to go. You you leave. You leave looking back. Ears ringing. Can't even go to sleep. It's a good thing the Lord saved me when He did. Else I'd be deaf. Back in the day, the disco era, they had long play songs. One song may last 16 minutes. <laughs> and you hate to see the party end. When it comes to God, most of us can't wait for the benediction. We're going to be judged on all that stuff. But anyway... They're, they're, they're organized to keep you from hearing the truth. And many in the world of religion, many in the church, have, they, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're part of it. You beware of all these relationship preachers. That's all they preach is relationship. They don't preach Bible. They don't preach scripture. They just preach anecdotal stories. They may, they may read from the Bible one time. The rest of the time, Anecdotal, 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 and, the, and this and this and this. And there's no emphasis on the scripture, the Bible, the person of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, God's standards. We're just going to have a loving atmosphere because we want to keep everybody comfortable. That's part of the organized effort to suppress the truth. So if we can keep you in church listening to gobbledygook, you won't be in a church hearing the truth. If we can get you, if we can get you comfortable, give you a donut and a cup of coffee and make sure we, your every sensibility has been satisfied and none of your sins are challenged and get you to fall in love with that, then you're not somewhere hearing about the wrath of God that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. The man with the largest church in America, packing 50,000 every Sunday, said on national television, I heard him, I might not know too much about the doctrine. Talking about the Christian doctrine. Now I want to know, I want to know, and, and get 50,000 to show up. I want to know how many of you are going to go to the doctor? And he, said, and he said to you, I might not know too much about medicine. The dentist, I might not know too much about uh, dentistry. You're in trouble. You walk into the law office. The lawyer tell you, well, I might not know too much about the law. Take your car to the mechanic unless you're just struggling. The man tell you, I don't know much about cars. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know what? 
Only in the church world can a person make that kind of admission and people still keep coming. I wouldn't go to no financial man. Well, I don't know much about finance, but I'm going to help you. <laughs> you I'd, I'd be like a ghost. You look up, ain't nothing there but an empty chair. I'm gone. There is a suppression. And while they're trying to hold God's truth down, they're just beaming from satellites on Facebook, all manner of communications. They are putting falsehoods before our eyes everywhere you look. And people are buying it. See, there are, certain, there are certain signs in society that let you know that people are buying it. Once a man, I mean, we went to school together, high school together, graduated college together. Oh, Jack. We ain't seen each other in five years. They woke up to me. I said, don't you recognize me? I said, no. Stand there in pumps and a dress. I'm, I'm Jack. I'm Jack, but now I'm Jackie. I didn't had everything change. And then if I then call him Jackie and participate with that charade, it ain't him. It's me. See, this thing is messing up. Messing with our minds. I want to pray. I want to pray today. That God, remember in my sermon, I said, I want you to be able to recognize this and then have the power to oppose it. Hallelujah. Starts with recognizing. He said, I'm not going along with this mess. I'm not buying this mess. Jesus is still the only Savior. Christianity is God's way. And the morals, why no God? We get our thou shalts and our thou shall nots from God. So if there are no God, there's no thou shalt. Thou shalt not. We can do anything we want. The devil is a liar. Keep me, Jesus. Anoint me, Jesus. Open my eyes, Jesus. Help me to see, Jesus. Meet me at the altar. Ooh. Truth still marches on. On and on. God's truth still, still marches, marches on.